it, it's my honor and privilege. I mean, you know, Buddy Pilgrim has become a friend. I'll tell you, we met through, we actually met at a meeting. I don't know where we were, D.C. DC or something. something to me. And uh, got talking, and, I, you know, he's one of those things, one of those conversations that went a long way in a hurry, and I could tell right off we had, you know, shared a lot of values. And over time, one of the things that, that uh, Buddy has, uh, one of the experiences Buddy has had is that he, he was the faith coordinator for Ted Cruz's campaign. And I got pretty involved in that, and I know some of you did as well. And, uh, you know, when you have a working relationship, you can tell so much about somebody. Do they come through? Do they do what they say they'll do? And uh, Buddy, every time, was a man of integrity all through that and a man of initiative and, and great work ethic that, that uh, drove hard. Uh, uh, you know, I wish we would have won, but now we're doing what we, we're, now we're doing the next best thing. Or the, maybe the 15th best thing, as it were, or whatever it is. But, uh, <clears throat> but anyhow, better than what I described earlier. So, uh, Buddy has been the, was it president and CEO, but he you know, led Pilgrim's Pride, you know, the, the correlation there, Buddy Pilgrim, Pilgrim's Pride, so led that company five and a half years, that's a multi-billion dollar company. Uh, only in Springdale, Arkansas could we say we have a bigger chicken industry than what Buddy ran, <laughs> probably, but, but uh, he's literally literally would be probably probably was the second biggest winner you know, and, uh, and then has also helped with the turnaround of other uh, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars of companies and um, but yesterday we had uh, several of us were in a class thank you mr. Bernie for for uh, that opportunity and I uh, I sat in on that list that on that too and it was just fascinating so I know we're gonna have a great time this morning and gain some understanding on the area of free enterprise from a biblical perspective and uh, but he also has a ministry he may want to describe more about that but I'm gonna I'm gonna step down here and, and hand the mic over and give buddy the, the time and buddy thank you for being with us this morning I'm fine thank you Warren I appreciate that introduction it's a pleasure to be with all of you here this is a really good crowd this is a this is an outstanding crowd um, Got a little bit of feedback, maybe take it down just a tiny bit. To give you a little bit of uh, information on my background, I know Oren told you I was uh, in the chicken business, and I was. I used to run Pilgrim's Pride, the chicken corporation. Most of my career has been in the chicken business. I've also spent a lot of time in northwest Arkansas, though. Back in the early 1990s, I left Pilgrim's and started a consulting business, and I did a lot of work for a company called Hudson Foods, which was uh, northwest Arkansas. Uh, company that was later acquired by Tyson. I know some of you may be familiar with Hudson Foods. And then uh, when I left Pilgrims the second time, I've left two times before in 1998, I went over to Salem Springs, Arkansas, and I was the CEO of Simmons Foods, uh, another poultry and food company, great organization. So I've spent much of my time over the last 20 years in northwest Arkansas for several years at a time, and this is a great part of the country to be in. Happy to be back today. Oren mentioned that I also have a ministry, and I do. When I left my role as president of Pilgrims, which was in 1998, I've been gone from there for, for quite a long time, uh, and I began to pray about what I was supposed to do, the Lord led me to start a ministry. I'd had a consulting business called Integrity Management Services before, and he began to stir this word leadership in my mind. And when I first heard it in my spirit, I thought he was just wanting me to change the name of my business to, from integrity management to integrity leadership. But as I prayed about it and really saw it as well, what I began to understand is he wanted me to start a separate entity, a ministry, because a passion of my life has always been to apply God's word to the workplace and to politics. Warren started out talking about politics just a minute ago. Some people don't like to talk about politics. They think it's a dirty business. Well, I want to tell you, it is a dirty business, and it will always be a dirty business as long as Christians stay out of it and we turn it over to the world. A lot of people feel the same way about business. Business itself is kind of a dirty thing. It's kind of a worldly thing. But you know what? It's a necessary thing. And the more that Christians remove themselves from active positions of power and leadership in business and ministry, the more we'll have undesirable results in those realms of authority here on earth. So the Lord led me to start this ministry called Integrity Leadership, and my specific calling in ministry is to apply the word 
to business and politics. Sometimes most people are very familiar with Jim Dobson and focus on the family where he was for so many years. You're all familiar with Jim Dobson, I, I, I suppose. And he's an easy way to explain what I do. What Dobson's calling in life is, is to apply the word to family life. And it's a very focused calling. That was probably a good name for his original ministry. Focus on the family. Well, just as his calling is focused on the family, mine is focused on business and politics. I am an ordained minister. I'm not a pastor. I'm not an evangelist. I'm not a prophet. I'm not an apostle. I am a teacher, and I know the specific calling. So what I'm going to talk to you about today is a combination of both business and politics. And I, I was blessed to be able to speak to the business class yesterday. I'm going to repeat some of what I covered with them, but obviously not all of what I covered. I had a, an hour and 20 minutes yesterday, and we've got about a little over 30 minutes right now, and I'll honor your time. So I'm going to go through some material very, very fast just to give you kind of a foundational overview, and then we're going to delve a little bit deeply into the uh, aspects of capitalism and free markets and the importance of people's involvement, the importance of Christian involvement in the marketplace. And I use that term marketplace in very broad terms. In fact, if I were to ask you right now, and I will, I'm not going to do a, a lot of raise your hand surveys, but I'll do one right now. How many of you in this room believe that for the, for the majority of the rest of your lives as you go forward into whatever career God calls you into, whether it's ministry or some form of business, how many of you in this room believe that for a substantial part of your lives going forward, you will be heavily involved in business? Some? Quite a few. Actually, more than, more than I thought. How many of you think you'll be heavily involved in politics? A few. Not, not quite as many. Well, I, I, will, uh, I will challenge you a little bit on that and say, ultimately, every one of us in this room for the rest of our lives, we'll be involved in both of those arenas. Because every time we go into a store to buy something, we're involved in business. Every time we go to a restaurant and purchase food, we're involved in somebody's business. So whether we decide that God is leading us to where we're becoming an owner or a manager of a business as opposed to being a missionary or a pastor or a worship leader or something directly involved in ministry, regardless of where our vocational career path takes us, every single one of us will be significantly involved in business because of the nature of our lives and the fact that we have to have goods and services that we get from other people. And I would say the same thing is also true of politics as well because whether we ever choose to run for office like a friend over here has run for office, each of us will be subject to and involved in the laws and the rules and the regulations, the rules of the road that are set by people who are in positions of power and authority in politics. So I want to begin now with a verse of Scripture that I think lays the foundation for why it's important for those of us who proclaim to be Christians, who have Christian values, get involved in these sorts of activities. And it goes back to the very creation, the very beginning of time in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 28. This is what it says. Then God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all of the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, even the creepy things. So God got up one day and he was talking to himself. I like the fact that he said, let us. That should tell you that there's a trinity that exists. He said, let us make man in our image. And then in verse 27, it says, and God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Now, we could spend a whole lesson just on that right there. God said what he was going to do, and then he did what he said. Could we not learn from that example right there? So he announced to himself, I've got this idea, I want to create a being different from all the beings, all the animals that I've created in the first five days of creation. This being is going to be in my likeness, in the likeness of God. And here is the job assignment that God gave us from the beginning of time. He said, I'll rule over you, although it's voluntary submission. Okay, It is voluntarily that we submit to the Lordship of Christ. But he says, the idea is, I'll rule over you, you rule over the earth. And then he did what he said. He created man. And then the first words that he spoke to man are in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. He said, And God blessed them, and he said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Increase. Grow in your influence, in your ability, and in your, in your power and influence over the earth. And he said, And fill the earth and subdue it 
and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. I'm reading out of the New American Standard, if any of you wonder the translation that I, that I use. So basically he, he said, your job assignment is to have dominion on earth. Now the Bible tells us that God is unchanging from the beginning of time. So I believe we can take this scripture and the scripture that tells us that God never changes... And we can know this from it. From the beginning of time, the desire of God's heart has been that people who have a right relationship with Him, because this was on the first day of creation, it was before the fall of man, it was before sin had entered in when He spoke these words to them, that people who have a right relationship with God would find themselves in positions of power and authority and influence on earth. Because the way this thing works out, a lot of people think that involvement in business, involvement in politics is a dirty thing. As Christians, we need to be oriented to more spiritual things. We need to be thinking about the long term, not the short term, the hereafter, not the here and now. But the truth is, God created us for the here and now. He could have just designed this situation where people are nothing more than spiritual beings like angels and he could have never created a physical earth and a physical you and a physical me and a physical place for us to live. But the truth is he created us as physical beings to live on this physical ball that hangs out in space and then he gave us this job assignment to rule over it. So it is actually not an unspiritual thing or an ungodly thing for us to be involved in all the things of this earth because he created us as physical beings. And in fact he talks... The whole Bible is all about our physical lives here on earth. There's some about the hereafter and some about heaven and those kind of things. But the majority of the teaching in the Bible deals with how we live in the here and now. So it is his desire that we be involved in the things of this earth. Now the second thing I want to ask you is I talk a lot about money. I teach a lot on business and when you teach on business that leads to the topic of money. And probably this will be the last kind of raise your hand question I have here. How many of you in this room have need for money? All the hands usually go up, okay? I've never found anybody yet who really thinks they don't have need for money. And I want to show you maybe your need for money is even greater than what you might think. In fact, I, mean, I want to show you how important the Bible says that money is. All of you are familiar with John 3.16, right? Probably all of you are familiar with the 23rd Psalms, right? All of you are probably familiar with 2 Chronicles 7, 14. There are probably hundreds of scriptures that you know and you could quote that you're familiar with through all of your uh, life. How many of you are familiar with Ecclesiastes 10, 19? Can anybody quote that one? Ecclesiastes 10, 19. I rarely ever see anyone, even when I speak at a minister's conference, that knows Ecclesiastes 10, 19. Let me put it up if I can see if, if I can... Oops, I picked up the wrong. Uh... Well, here we go. Ecclesiastes 10, this is 18 and 19. Verse 18 shows you the context for this. Ecclesiastes 10, 18 says, Through indolence or laziness, the rafters of the house, which is the state of affairs, sag or decay. And through slackness, that is through idle hands, the roof leaks, the house leaks. That basically tells us if you don't do anything, if you don't work at anything, things begin to fall apart. Verse 19 says this, Men prepare a meal or a feast for enjoyment. That's true. Wine makes life merry. Doesn't say go get drunk though. And then the end of that says money is the answer to everything. Most people don't know that there is a scripture in the Bible that says... Some translations say, money answers all things. So anytime we think, boy, that's a very worldly, not a spiritual point of view to be talking about money, always remember Ecclesiastes 10.19 says money answers all things. Now, I want you to understand that doesn't mean that money substitutes for Christ in our life. It doesn't mean that money substitutes for our lordship to, to God. But what it does mean is this. In everything that we do, Money is part of the necessary answer. The Hebrew word that's translated answer right there where it says money answers all things means to respond to. So when you understand that, that scripture says in everything that we do, money is part of the necessary response. And some people say, well, I don't know about that. See, because there are some times when I don't necessarily need money. God really called me to ministry. Sometimes all I want to do is just walk across the street and find a friend of mine that has a need and I just want to kneel down and pray with them. All I want to do is go out on the street corner and witness for Christ and that doesn't take money. I just want to be a, a, a street evangelist. I just want to pray for somebody when they have need. 
when you walk across the street to pray for somebody, you burn calories. The calories that you burn, now sometimes we can need a few calories to be burned off, but over the long haul, the calories that we burn, if we do nothing but walk across the street, do they not have to be replaced? And it takes money to buy food to replace the calories. You're probably not going to go across the street to witness somebody buck naked. So you're probably going to need some clothes to wear when you go across the street to witness to somebody or to go to the hospital or pray for a friend unless you want to get arrested when you're out doing that. So the point is, no matter what you're doing, even if it is nothing more than just our simple setting in this room here today, we need clothing, we need food, we need transportation, we need provision, and money is the medium that we use to acquire all of those things. So the Bible knows exactly what it's talking about right here when it says in every situation that we engage in, money is the necessary answer to the situation that we're in. So we all need money. Now, I'll give you this very brief overview of what I talked to the business class about yesterday. To lay down this, uh, this premise that God wants to be the source of provision where we get our financial needs met. Now, we have a role to play, but he is ultimately the provider. And this goes back to Genesis as well. In Genesis chapter 12, verse, uh, chapter 12, verse 1, we have the beginning of what we call the Abrahamic covenant. God came to Abraham one day, and he spoke to him. His name was Abram at the time. And he said, I want you to leave your land, leave your family, leave your household, leave the land where you are in your father's household, go to the land where I tell you to go. And in that land, I'll give you more influence, houses, and blessings. He basically said, now there's nothing wrong with having land and family and houses, but don't put your trust in your land, your family, and your houses. He said, if you'll trust me, go where I tell you to go, do what I tell you to do, follow my direction in every part of your life, not put your trust in land and family and houses, I'll give you more land and family and houses. That's the covenant promise that God made. There's a scripture in the New Testament though, and I love this one, because it's in Mark chapter 10, verses 29 and 30, Jesus was responding to Peter. Now, Peter had come to Jesus one day. We all know Peter was kind of an outspoken disciple. He was one of the most outspoken and bold ones. And he came to Jesus one day, and he said, I call it WIFM. You ever heard of the term WIFM? W-I-I-F-M. It's an acronym that stands for what's in it for me. Jesus went to, Peter went to Jesus one day, and he said, what about us? We've left our businesses to follow you. We've left what we used to do to follow you. And Jesus didn't turn around and say, how dare you ask such a selfish, earthly-minded question. In fact, he answered him this way in Mark chapter 10, verses 29 and 30. He said to Peter, there is no one who has left houses or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or farms, land, for my sake but that he shall receive a hundred times as much now in this present age, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and farms. And then he goes on to say, oh, and by the way, eternal life. So Jesus' answer to Peter when he said, what's in it for me, was not to scold him and it was not to say, well, what's in it for you is the sweet by and by. He spent more time answering about the here and now than he did about the by and by. He did tell him you'll get eternal life as well. But he said, let me tell you, if you truly don't put your trust in those things and you follow me, you'll end up with more, not less. If you trust me as the source for those things. That passage in Mark chapter 10 is almost identical to the covenant promise that God made Abraham in Genesis 12 verse 1. That's one of the ways that we know that the promise that God made Abraham applies to us today. There are many other scriptures I don't have time to go through and cite all of them today that tell us that the Abrahamic covenant applies to us today. There are scriptures all throughout Galatians, Galatians 3.29, that says that the blessing of Abraham would come to the Gentiles. It talks in Galatians about us being heirs of Abraham. It talks about it being an everlasting covenant. So if we are in Christ Jesus, we are heirs with Abraham to the covenant promise that God made for him. Well, some people might think, well, that covenant promise is great, but what that covenant promise really meant was it had to do with a spiritual relationship between God and Abraham. It didn't have to do with earthly possessions and money and all of those kinds of things. But no, the blessing does include all of those spiritual things. It includes a relationship with God, the ability to hear from Him, the ability for Him to speak into our lives and into our spirit and give us direction and comfort and peace that passes understanding and all of those things. But what it also does, it, is, it includes physical, material blessings and provision in this life as well. 
And we know that it does because there's several descriptions of Abraham throughout the book of Genesis, one in particular by one of his servants that goes to give testimony about his master. And he said, let me tell you about my boss, Abraham. God has blessed him. And in one scripture it says, God blessed him in every way. Not just a few ways, not just spiritually, not just relationship wise. God blessed him in every way. And the servant goes on to say, and it says, God's made him rich. And some say, well that means rich spiritually. It doesn't mean rich financially. But in that same verse of scripture it goes forward and it says, no it does mean rich financially. Because it says he's blessed him in every way. God's made him rich. And it says he has herds and flocks. Plural. Not a herd. Not a flock. You could make the case that back in those days you couldn't go down to the local grocery store and buy the meat that you needed. So you needed a herd or you needed a flock to provide the food for your family. But it didn't say a herd or a flock. It said herds plural, flocks plural. Those are business assets. Those are business resources. And it says so he's given him flocks and herds. He's given him silver and gold. That's money. And he's given him maid servants and men servants. Those are employees that work for him. And then it says he's given him lots of cars and trucks as well. It does. It says he's given him donkeys and camels. Well, what do you think a donkey and a camel was back then? One might be a pickup and the other one's a sports car, you know? <laughs> Depending on the way how you want to drive. What you cannot argue against, though, is that a donkey and camel are transportation vehicles named separately even from the herds and the flocks, which were a part of the business. So God doesn't mind you having a nice car or a nice truck or maybe even more than one because he blessed Abraham with many of those. So we know that Abraham was very rich. We know that those promises are for us today. But it begs the question, how do you bring about this wealth or prosperity that we need in our lives? Now, there is no certain amount of money that is defined as wealthy. Some people like to demonize this whole concept of wealth. One of the things that, you know, Oren was talking about a minute ago is where we are in our political environment today. I think it is a very sad state of affairs that we are in an environment today where money and wealth is so demonized and business itself is so demonized in the politically correct uh, environment that we have today. In fact, I'm going to read from one of my newsletters. and We're, we're going to make four of these newsletters available to you online if you want to. This is a newsletter I wrote on profit. It says profit's not a four-letter word. I'm going to read the opening paragraph. It says, we've reached a strange and unfortunate point in America and indeed in much of the world. It has now become, quote, politically correct and highly popular to demonize and criticize business in general and profits in particular. In fact, to speak well of a highly successful business, especially a large business, is almost taboo. And it's completely unacceptable in today's society. This is a twisted and negative view of success in business that has emerged. And it's a view that is dangerous to the welfare of the nation, to freedom itself, and even to the spreading of the gospel. This month I'm going to begin examining why this negative outlook is wrong and harmful. That's the opening paragraph on this newsletter. Profit is not a four-letter word. Do you think that's a timely thing to say where we are today? I wrote this newsletter in 2003. And boy, have I continued to see this come to fruition. We're far worse today in the things that I said in this newsletter in 2003 than we were back then in terms of the demonization of success, the demonization of prosperity, the demonization in particular of business, and the lifting up of government. And it's important that we understand this. Even the things that Oren talked about a minute ago on the homosexual agenda. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking on that. But I do want to touch on it because all these things are tied together. I believe one of the reasons, in fact it's really the primary reason, that the left is so focused on the homosexual agenda is not because of this issue of rights that they want to extend to them. But now it's gone from... And you know they never use the word the homosexual agenda. It's it, the, the wording that the left use, they are so effective in how they position things and the words that they use. They're far better than conservatives and people on the right on framing the issue. Because we've gone from the, using the word homosexual to using the word gay, which sounds a little more innocuous and a little friendlier and a little nicer, to now the word gay is not even used very much. And it's the LGBT community. 
so that you group all of these different people into this one wonderful community, the B in there being bisexual, which really has nothing to do with somebody saying, if someone will say, I've got a legitimate issue in my life, I think I'm, you know, I, I'm, I'm a homosexual, I'm a man that's drawn to women, or I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a man that's drawn to other men, or I'm a woman that's drawn to other women. Bisexuality is neither one of those kind of things. That's just sexual depravity. I just want to have sex with both men and women. That's just depravity. But they're included in that LGBT. And LGP, LGBT is, it's, isn't that such, of a, such a nice, innocuous sounding term? And it's the LGBT community. So when you start using those kind of words and phrases to frame things, then you get away from what's really going on. You, be, you begin to uh, soften what's really happening. Now, the reason I brought that up is because this trend, this focus on LGBT rights, I don't like using the, real, the term LGBT rights, but I'm using it only in the context of how it's presented in politics now. This whole issue of these LGBT rights and what we've seen most recently in the most extreme application of that or the claims of that where men can claim they're now women. That You talk about science deniers, the left likes to accuse the right of being science deniers because some of us don't believe that, that, the, that human beings are changing the climate on the planet, so we're science deniers. Let me tell you the biggest science denier of all, that you can look at a sonogram of a child in the womb and see the nose and the eyes and the feet and the hands of that baby and watch it move literally in real time in a sonogram. I just had my first grandchild a couple of years ago, and we watched those sonograms of our granddaughter when she was in the womb at just a few weeks of age, just a few months of age. You know, talk about science denying? Rather, that's science denying. To look at that and deny that that is anything other than a living baby in the womb of that mother. And that to take the life of that child is anything other than destroying human life. That it is not reproductive health care. There is nothing reproductive or healthy about terminating, ending, murdering the life of an unborn child. But this whole issue about the homosexual agenda and the words that they use and all those kind of things and the fact that a man can say, well, I'm not a man today, I'm a woman. Not because my biology has changed. That's how I got off on the science denier thing. You can't deny the science of biology. If I have a man's body parts and a man's chromosomes, I'm a man. I can say I'm a woman all day long. I can dress like a woman all day long, but it's not going to change the fact I am a man. And if I'm a woman and I have a woman's body parts, biological parts, chromosomes, I could dress like a man all day long and cut my hair off short and try to deepen my voice and everything else. But you know what? I'm still a man, no matter what I claim to be or pretend to be. But it's, it is important for them to begin to remove all differences between men and women. These, these SOGI laws that are putting in place. SOGI is sexual orientation and gender identity. That allows a man to say, I'm a woman today, so I'm going to use the woman's bathroom. There's a purpose behind every bit of this. And this is all being executed through the political environments, why it's important for us to be involved in politics. The purpose behind every bit of this is to destroy the family as the foundational unit of all of society. And in the book of Genesis, at the beginning of time, right after God created man, as I read just a minute ago, he created him a helpmate, and he put them together, man and woman. And then they had two children. And then they had other children after that. But from the beginning of time, God's plan for mankind is for the family unit to be the foundational unit of all of society. And every time we see economic problems in the inner city, every time we see relationship problems with people, you can trace it back and it will, it will tie back to the breakdown and to the destruction of the traditional family as this foundational unit for all of society. Well, why would the left want to destroy the family as the foundational unit of all of society? The answer is really simple. Because when you destroy the family as that, then you begin to replace government as the foundational unit. And in fact, you can only destroy the family as the foundational unit of society by destroying Judeo-Christian values. That's why they come after the church 
so thoroughly. Because the only way you can replace God with government is to first attack freedom of religion, which is our most important freedom of speech. And by the way, our Constitution promises that we are to have freedom of religion. It says that they are to make no law respecting the free exercise of our religion. Lately you don't hear much talk about that, especially from the left. What they talk about is that you have freedom of worship. But see, freedom of worship is you can worship however you want to when you're, when you're in the confines of the four walls of this Christian school, when you're in the confines of your church or synagogue or wherever you go to worship. You have freedom to worship however you want as long as you keep your worship inside the four walls of where you go to. But you don't have freedom of religion because you can't take your, your, your beliefs and express them in the public square. That's what they want you to believe. But the truth is, our beliefs need to be reflected in the public square. You see, someone's values are going to be reflected in the laws that are enacted and in the way things of this earth are managed and run. So it might as well be ours. And it certainly won't be if we withdraw ourselves from those things. So the agenda is to destroy the family unit. It's to replace... God with government, and it's for us to look to government for the things of this earth, the things that we need. I want to talk about wealth and money for just a minute. We've only got a couple of more minutes. I do want to make sure I cover this. Because we demonize wealth, in particular the left demonizes wealth, although they want the government to be the source of all the wealth that you have and need in your life. Wealth is not a bad thing. In fact, if you look at the dictionary definition of wealth, it says wealth is defined in economic terms simply as value. And it is value that is manifested or brought about through the process of exchange. Now, if I had more time to teach on this, I would, I would take you scripture by scripture and verse, chapter and verse, and I would show you that this whole concept of exchange, that, uh, that we do business with one another, is not man's idea. It's actually God's idea. I hear sometimes in churches where I go to that a pastor's preached a sermon saying we don't need to get involved in the Babylonian system. And they decry that business is a Babylonian system that we're to remove ourselves from. But business is not a Babylonian system. Many people operated in an incorrect and an improper manner and according to a wrong set of values and, and things like that. But business itself is part of God's design. You see, He designed us to be what I call individually insufficient such that we not only need Him in our life, we need each other in our life. He gifted each of us in this room with different talents and skills and ability, with different callings upon our life, such that we become more productive when we exchange with one another. Wealth is manifested as value brought about when we enter into this exchange process. Well, if wealth is defined as value, what's value? Value occurs when one person has something that another one wants. If, no, if you have something and nobody else is interested in it, nobody else wants it, it may have sentimental value to you, but it has no economic value at all. I've got a lot of things in my house that have sentimental value to me. My wife wishes I would throw them away. I've still got my tricycle from when I was a kid. I've kept it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, completely uh, rehab it and give it to my granddaughter that I just have that's two years old now. Now my wife laughs at me because that because she said she's going to have no interest in having a 50-year-old tri tricycle or a 60-year-old tricycle. Okay, She's not going to have any interest in that, but I'm going to do it anyway. That tricycle has sentimental value, but I want to assure you, it has no economic value really, other than maybe the metal I could get if I melted it down. But we're talking about economic value occurs when one person has something that another one wants. It is nothing than the measurement manifested. And it's manifested through money. So money, I read that verse of scripture earlier that says money answers all things. What is money? Money is nothing more than the facilitator of exchange. It's the currency that carries value so that exchange becomes an easy process. And then the last definition I want to touch on is the definition of business itself. Business is defined by Random House Dictionary as the exchange of goods and services and I love the fact that they add this last part to it, in an effort to make an economic gain. Even Random House recognizes that the purpose of a business transaction is to make a profit, it's to make an economic gain. So if you take these definitions and you look at them backwards or you look at them in reverse order and in a simplified format, here's what you'll see. 
Business is defined as the exchange of goods and services. Necessary because God created us and designed us to exchange with one another, to do business with one another. Money is simply the facilitator, and if you recognize business is the definition of exchange is the definition of business, and substitute the words there. So business is the exchange. Money is the facilitator that makes business easy. Value is the measurement of business, and wealth is that which is generated by business transactions. And by the way, I want to make sure I cover this point as well. I often ask in a business transaction, such as the sale of a car, who profits the most from that transaction? And if we had more time, some might raise their hand and say, well, the car dealer profits the most. The car dealer probably is the one that has the largest amount of margin. Some might say, I think the manufacturer profits the most because manufacturers have a bigger margin than the dealer does on the average car. Others might say, you know, sometimes the salesman profits the most in that transaction because if he's right at the edge and that, that one more car bumps him up into a new bonus category, he may get a really big bonus, bigger than the amount of profit that the dealer would make on the car. So you can make all these arguments about who profits the most when someone buys a car. My answer to you is this. The one who profits the most in the sale of a car is not any of those that I just named. It's the one who buys the car. See, we think of profit as only accruing to the selling end of the transaction, but the truth is when you understand that profit simply means benefits from, that the person who profits the most from any business transaction is one on the buying end of the deal because I wouldn't buy a car if the full value of that car weren't worth it to me. I buy this sports coat that I'm wearing right now because it is more profitable for me to buy this coat than to attempt to manufacture and make this coat on my own. I buy my cars because it is more profitable for me to buy a car than to try to make a car on my own. I go to the grocery store and I buy a baked potato a baking potato, because it is more profitable for me to go to the store and buy that baking potato than for me to try to go, to the, go out in the backyard, dig a hole, plant a potato, have it grow, and have it be ready to dig out of the ground at the very day in the afternoon that I'm ready to put it in the microwave or put it in the oven and bake it. It is more profitable for me to do that. So this whole concept of profits is misguided when we think about profits being an evil thing because profits are what businesses try to do on the backs of their customers. No, profits benefit both sides of the transaction. And we don't have time to go any, any more deeply into this today uh, to, to the extent that I would like to. But it is why free enterprise is so vitally important. And it's why free enterprise needs to be supported not only by us as individuals, but through our political environment as well. And our political environment in the United States has year by year, decade by decade, moved further and further away from the concepts of capitalism and free markets and more and more to government control of society. But you see, in a truly free market, no one can really become wealthy except when they do so at the benefit of the people with whom they do business. Because in a truly free market, now you can cheat anybody on any individual transaction, but I'm talking about over the long haul in a truly free market with the minimum amount of regulation. If you cheat people on a regular basis, word's going to go out about that. You're going to hear about it. People are going to hear about it, and they're going to quit doing business with you. In a truly free market, people do not become wealthy at the expense of their customers. You can only become wealthy to the benefit of your customers. In fact, when you understand that the definition of wealth is value manifested in an exchange, you really can see that becoming wealthy is actually a very good thing because you can only become wealthy because you've provided a substantial amount of value to the people with whom you did business. So it's not a negative thing at all. Free enterprise free markets, in a free society that is being threatened right now by our political environment and distorted by the language that you hear on the news and in the political discussions throughout this country. Free markets and free enterprise and capitalism are one of the most important things or some of the most important things that we as Christians can support in the way we vote and in the way we do business and in how we look to God to be part of our provision. 
And just one closing statement. I wish I had time to go into this more. We as Christians have a very unique responsibility to be faithful stewards every time we engage in a business transaction. Now, I'm not talking about business just when we're employed by somebody. We have a responsibility there, and there are biblical principles for that. Jacob was a faithful employee when he worked for his uncle Laban year after year after year, even though Laban was a liar and a cheat and a thief. Laban changed the deal on Jacob ten times, it says. Yet Jacob remained faithful. So should we, even when we work for an unjust boss. But the other place we should be faithful, and I like giving this little example because it will drive it home, is we are enga- when we are engaged in other people's business. In, in Luke, it tells us we should be faithful in the little things. That if we can't be faithful in the little, we won't be faithful in much. And it says specifically, if you can't be faithful in that which is another man's, why should you be entrusted with that which would be more of your own? So every time we go into a store, or I used to go into a restaurant, I like ketchup, and I'd grab a handful of those little ketchup packets, and I might get six or eight of them and use three or four. And when I was done, I'd put two or three that are left on my tray and go dump them in the trash. It's no big deal. It's just a little thing if I throw away three or four packets of ketchup that came from that restaurant. Oh, it's a big thing. Because you see, the Bible says there is no little thing. He said, if I can't be faithful in the little things, why would I expect to be faithful in much? And when I understand that business is the only system that creates wealth, only a business transaction manifests value, then I understand that that restaurant is somebody else's wealth-producing, wealth-generating system. And how dare I take it upon myself to discard a package of ketchup or a handful of napkins or even those little salt and pepper deals. How dare I go into a clothing store to buy clothing and knock three or four things off the rack and let them fall on the floor and step on them and not care enough to put it back, pick it back up and put it back in its place because that's somebody else's wealth-producing, wealth-generating system. And if I want God to bless the work of my hands, I need to be faithful every time I engage in somebody else's wealth-producing, wealth-generating system. And every time I go to vote, I need to make sure I think about the ways that the people that I'm voting for are going to impact our opportunity to operate in a free society that allows people to engage in business for the benefit of their customers, for the benefit of their clients. And when we do that, God can honor the work of our hands and we'll see our country change for the better as well. Amen? Amen. God bless you. Thank you, Warren. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, buddy, let me say just thank you very much for investing into our lives uh, by teaching these principles from the Word of God, from your experience. Grateful to you. Grateful for your service as a Board of Regents member and grateful for your friendship. Thank you very much for being with us. And uh, thank you again. Yes, absolutely. Uh,